Uh, our speaker tonight is uh, Dr. Eliasson, uh, that I uh, assume many of you already know, professor of political science at East Charlottesville University. Uh, Dr. Eliasson's main areas of scholarly interest are trade policy and the uh, politiza politicization of or contestation over trade investments, uh, focusing geographically on transatlantic relations, which include uh, Canada and Mexico. Uh, his research has focused on policy aspects of trade, uh, civil society and business organizations lobbying for trade agreements. He has lectured and presented on these topics in six countries and has spent a significant amount of time with uh, civil organization, business groups, parliamentarians, members of the U.S. Trade uh, Representative's Office and European Trade of Officials. He has eight peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters on various aspects of trade policy uh, and lobbying, which are published or accepted for pu publication in the past 20 months. Uh, some of his recent articles are co-authored with uh, Dr. Garcia Duran from the University of Barcelona, with whom he is also currently working on a book titled Contesting Policy, the Transatlantic Trade Negotiations, due to be published in 2018. Please join me to welcome Dr. Lyson. Thank you. Um, the politicization is just another word for saying how you fight over what goes into trade and who gets what and where. Um, I can put everyone to rest to say that there will be no economic models tonight. There will be no math. There will be a limited amount of statistics. Uh, and there will be a lot of photos uh, to help illustrate a few things. Um, there will not be PowerPoint, death by PowerPoint, I promise you. Um, and there will be a lot of anecdotes. Uh, it's unfortunate that these comments will be as timely as they are because the potential repercussions of what has happened over the last, over the last uh, several weeks and what is to come, uh, because most of what we've heard about has not yet been implemented, will hit everyone in this room without exception, guaranteed. And there is not a lot in this world we can guarantee. But if what President Trump has promised and what the Chinese has prom have promised in retaliation and what the Europeans have promised in retaliation does occur, Jobs will be lost, prices will go up, and economic growth will be hit, guaranteed. That is the unfortunate circumstance in which we find ourselves, <coughs> and we've been here before, with very poor results. Uh, none of us were alive at that time, I assume, in the early 1930s, but the results were nonetheless very informative of what may happen today. But we'll get back to that uh, in a little while. Um, I want to start... Um, in a few minutes, just giving a little bit of basics of what trade actually is and what investments are. Uh, because I think people have very different conceptions of what they think of when they hear trade. Um, talk a little bit about what trade agreements actually are, because they're actually not predominantly about what the president is talking about and what other commentators are talking about. Uh, they've moved on from there. Um, and then, um, we will get back to the steel and the aluminum and the Chinese response and everything else is that is in the news as well. But given, and I don't have a clicker, so apologize. I apologize for that. Given um, President Trump's recent statements, I want to start with a 20-second response from the guy who's in charge of the largest economic market in the world. And yes, that is not President Trump the largest economy in the world in terms of one integrated market is in Europe. And the president there is a very outspoken whiskey drinking gentleman that will personally feel the repercussions of what is to come. And this was his response to Trump's initial statement that <laughs> trade wars are easy to win and the Europeans should suffer just as much as we do. So now we will also impose import tariffs, he said in Hamburg. This is basically a stupid process, the fact that we have to do this, but we have to do it. We'll now impose tariffs on motorcycles, Harley-Davidson, on blue jeans, Levi's, on bourbon. We can also do stupid. We also have to be this stupid. So blöd können wir auch. response that you would expect from a person of his caliber. 
But then again, if you knew him, that was be expected. But it is, yeah, it is stupid. And we'll get back to that in a little while. Uh, first, though, first things first. Trade, the basic exchange, someone selling something to someone else, is at the fa at face value very simple. I have something that you wish to buy, you have something you wish to purchase, and you agree on the terms. But for all intents and purposes, that is not what a trade is actually. Because we set up a bunch of rules and regulations of what's allowed, when it's allowed to be sold, when it's allowed to be made, to whom it's allowed to be sold, under what circumstances, in what quantities, and under what price. And we'll also learn that that's actually what most trade agreements are about. All of these rules and regulations that actually stipulate who can sell to when, to whom, when, how, and under what circumstances. So it's a little bit more complicated than just saying, I'm going to sell you something. But for all intents and purposes, the things that we use on a daily basis, the very features that we all use to get dressed, to drive, to communicate, are affected by trade. All of you are wearing clothes, I assume. <laughs> um, all of them, guaranteed, come from outside of the country, our country. All of them have fabrics from at least two countries. I can guarantee you this. Why? Because unless you're wearing the most high-end uh, uh, shoes and clothes uh, of any sort that you can possibly find, it's most likely uh, built abroad. Likewise, the computer that we all carry in our pockets, that the, 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 the technology that makes that run is mostly made in the United States, as we'll see a little later. But the point here being, trade includes all of the issues, all of the products that we, that we use on a daily basis, um, and some of the ways in which those products and services are made that we all use, for example, use social media. The rules regulating how your information that is on Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, etc., is actually decided in Brussels. Why? Because they actually care about data protection. And they care perhaps sometimes a little too much. And they set very stringent regulations. So all the American companies follow those rules everywhere in the world because they're the highest. Okay? On the other hand, we were really adamant about making sure that lead wasn't in toys, for example, while the rest of the world basically neglected it. So another feature of trade is those who produce stuff, those who sell stuff, take standards from wherever they are highest so that they can cover all the markets into which they want to sell, to sort of cover their bases. Um, number three, tariffs, that is in the news a lot, are taxes, okay? They are still a feature of trade, but these taxes are things you really don't see. They're imposed when you buy something from another country, then it, when it comes into the country, is imposed on the wholesale price that then the retailer charges you for. And that's also something we'll get to in a few minutes. You'll see how that affects everyone in this room. Um, not everyone here carries an iPhone, I know. Uh, I plead guilty to have switched manufacturers many times. But iPhones are the iconic example of what's called global value chains. Because the car you drive, the phone you use, the computer you use for work, are all, all consist of components from around the world. And I'm not going to read the slide. I'm not going to insult your intelligence. You can all do that. But we are going to listen to a nice British voice for a couple of minutes to explain <laughs> simply uh, and easily how this system works. <laughs> Trade is the engine of the global economy. More people, more goods, and more services are crossing borders today than ever before. But trade has changed dramatically in the 21st century. Through much of history, a good produced in a country was largely made of parts sourced there. Today, products are composed of parts from all over the world. To fully understand trade, we have to measure the value added at each point in the process. 
Imagine China exports a $100 smartphone to the United States. China may have only produced $10 or $20 of the total value of that phone. The rest of it was imported from elsewhere. Graphic design from a California studio, computer code from programmers in France, a silicon chip from a factory in Singapore, precious metals mined in Bolivia. Many countries benefit from the export of this phone. But standard trade data does not reflect this. What's needed is a system for tracing the value that is added by all countries involved in producing this phone. The OECD WTO Trade and Value Added Initiative aims to help people understand that traditional trade data is not actually telling the whole story. Standard data shows that China has high surpluses with the United States and the European Union, and a large deficit with that phone. The rest of it was imported from elsewhere. Surplus means that you sell more than you import. Deficits mean that you export less than you buy from abroad, just so that everyone is clear on that. Many countries benefit from the exports of this phone, but standard trade data does not reflect this. What's needed is a system for tracing the value that is added by all countries involved in producing this phone. The OECD WTO Trade and Value Added Initiative aims to help people understand that traditional trade data is not actually telling the whole story. Standard data shows that China has high surpluses with the United States and the European Union, and a large deficit with Japan. Looked at in value-added terms, China's surpluses and deficits decrease as Chinese exports have a high foreign content. Japan is another country that has run high trade surpluses with the United States and more recently with China. Value-added data reveals smaller surpluses with China and larger surpluses with the United States. This analysis can illustrate who actually benefits from trade and by how much in terms of both income and jobs. Trade improves competitiveness. Cheaper imports of parts and cheaper access to services bring benefits to consumers and companies alike. To realize the full potential, we need seamless border crossings, simpler customs procedures, sophisticated logistics, and more trade liberalization, especially in services. The last 10 seconds is an advocacy for the uh, promotion of trade liberalization. That aside, the point here is trade consists of a lot of different component parts from a lot of different places in the world that are partly assembled in various other places and then completely assembled in some final destination after which it is shipped to the final consumer. Right? So the simplest forms, like a pencil or a cell phone, have numerous parts from different parts of the world, which means things like threatening a country with punishing taxes or restrictions on their import can actually hurt a lot of people other than the people that you aim to protect with those measures. So trade has a lot of different components. Um, there are a lot of myths, though, going around that I also want to take a few minutes and uh, discuss. Because the biggest, of course, and the fear, particularly in the United States, uh, and particularly among labor unions, is that trade causes job losses. And yes, of course, when certain sectors become less competitive with, sectors, uh, with companies from other countries, certain job losses occur, no doubt. The bigger problem, though, with job losses as we emerge from throughout history, from the agricultural era, through the industrial era, through computerized era and service era, is the advancement in this, technology. Study after study after study shows more than 60, sometimes up to 70, 80 percent, depending on the sector, of job losses are caused by technological innovation. And my guess is that most people would not want to create jobs by, by all of us scrapping our cell phones and computers and going back to working on the farm. Technology is something we actually welcome. Um, so yes, there are job losses when sectors in the United States and elsewhere compete with similar firms in similar sectors elsewhere. But it also means, as we saw previously, that you can create new jobs 
in new companies, in new sectors, with new technology. Myth number one. Two, trade isn't good because companies move all their, com their production offshore to these low cost, low, low labor cost uh, countries where you exploit the workers and you get stuff made real cheaply. Well, there used to be some truth in that uh, when first we offshored ex uh, textile industry, for example, in the United States to China. It's true. But where in the world do you think the vast majority of American investments, in other words, money that firms, companies have, that they put into new factories, to hiring new workers, to paying workers, where in the world do you think that actually goes? Any guesses? No, offshore. <laughs> yeah. Seven. Yes. More than three quarters of American investments abroad go to companies where the average wages are higher than the United States, where the social costs are higher. So why in the world would that be the case? Well, if you think of it, if you have a company and you want to expand, you want to sell more stuff, you need rule of law. You need guaranteed contracts to be upheld. You need educated workforce. And you also want access to a new market so you can sell stuff, right? So that's also part of the trade. Yes, there are investments that go into Asia. There are investments that go into Africa. But they are very, very, very small compared to where American firms actually put most of their money. So things like education, training, and access to skilled workforce is really important. And think of this. One country that's been in the news with President Trump and others as of late, Obama sort of broached the issue first, uh, is Germany. I don't think most Germans would have thought three years ago that they would be held up as sort of a model for the United States to follow. but. Um, they have repeatedly been held up as an example of what you should look at to get a good manufacturing base and create jobs and grow the economy, right? Germany produces a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff, like products, tangible things that you can hold. And they create a lot of jobs. And they do so by having vocational training, practicums, internships, right? And they spend 65 times more per person on that training than does the United States. And that's after the United States doubled federal spending on that in the last budget. And what do they have? They have the best technicians, machinists, uh, and, uh, and other skilled uh, people who produce car parts, uh, uh, electronics, uh, engines, turbines, you name it, and export all around the world. And they compete with the Chinese and outperform them. Go down to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and you'll see that working here, where Siemens, the German company, is investing $100,000 per student annually in the same type of training. So I'm only bringing this up because there are alternatives. Um, I mentioned unions here. Labor unions in the US have never met a trade agreement or trade pact or trade anything that they like. Um, Bernie Sanders, one of the competitors to Trump, in the latest presidential election, actually had very similar views on trade as Trump did. So it's not necessarily uncertain that we would have ended up in different positions with a different president. Um, but he held up the Scandinavians at the model for how you combat globalization and you ensure that workers have the best possible environment. And he held up Sweden and Denmark several times. Sweden is a complete right to work state. The entire country has no job guarantees, no permanent employment. In Denmark, you can hire and fire easily, more easily than any other country of the rich countries in the world. And so, and for example, closed labor union shops are not allowed in Sweden by law. What he missed in that whole part was that the labor unions, they actually want more trade. They are begging the government to open up more. They are protesting for more trade agreements through the European Union to more openness because they have seen the correlation between producing stuff that they sell and wealth. In Asia, you can look at Japan, South Korea, 
Taiwan, and you'll see the same phenomenon. Another myth is that others cheat, and therefore we have to retaliate. Yes, China cheats. China forces some American companies to give up their technology. Uh, China takes a product, say if uh, Matt uh, had a company in China and he produced better hair, hair uh, dryers than anyone else and he would sell them to the United States way below what it cost to make them. And why could he do so? Because he got subsidies from the Chinese government and a whole host of other help. Yes, he cheats. There's a lot of companies in China that cheat this way. But the problem is when you want to combat that in a world where products move around and components are produced everywhere, if you take one player like the United States and say, we're going to penalize you on your own, you're not going to be very effective. And China's going to hit you back big time. So are there, prom are there problems to China? Absolutely. But the same problems exist for the Europeans, for the Australians, for the Japanese, for the Koreans. So working together with them, we could definitely make a big change in how China uh, cheats on the international in, in many areas of trade. Absolutely. But doing it unilaterally is pretty much stupid. Um, funny, imports are only bad because we buy a bunch of stuff from other uh, parts. It takes away our jobs because we could produce them here. If any of you in your family have had anyone who worked in the docks, longshoremen, you would know it's a very well-paid job, good benefits, and it's very secure. They benefit from imports because the more imports you have, the more work there is from that. Truck drivers, the single biggest employment category for white men with a high school diploma in the United States. The more imports we have, the more truck drivers we need. Rails, we have the largest fleet of rail freight in the world. Those imports from Long Beach go out on rails to the rest of the country. And component parts that go into cars, to planes, and a whole host of other things come from the rest of the world. We don't actually make some stuff. Physically impossible to make certain things to go into cars in the United States. So we need certain imports. So all imports are not bad. <coughs> and finally, to use the words of not all our president, you don't take this the, the wrong way. I will give you examples of how previous presidents of the United States have acted worse than President Trump currently does. Much worse. Democrats and Republicans alike. But just because we buy more stuff from others than we sell to them in nominal value doesn't make, one, make that worse than having the opposite. If you go to your grocery store and you give them a $100 bill and you get milk and bread and cookies and whatever else you buy, you have a deficit. I run a deficit in my grocery store every month. But I'm pretty happy with that, right? They're not going to buy stuff from me, but I'm certainly going to buy stuff from them. And that exchange is something I actually like and I benefit from. So this nomer that everything that we import is bad and everything we export is good, in today's interconnected world is utterly incorrect. OK, so let's look at what Americans actually then think of trade, bearing in mind that what trade is is, of course, a subjective issue. Uh, generally, historically, Americans have been generally favorable towards trade. Um, a minority believe that it actually creates jobs. Um, but the real issue, the problem that has arisen in the United States has to do with this. Not that the president's supporters oppose trade. That's not the problem. The problem has to do with the fact that inside the Democratic Party and the Republican Party today, you have a real cross-cutting dilemma. And this creates a really problematic situation for you and for the elected officials, whomever you support. Because the Republican leadership is very much pro-trade, wants more trade agreements, promote exports of US companies, support imports for products we need, whereas the base 
is very much opposed. The base is predominantly in the south and the middle part of the country, predominantly middle and lower middle class. The Democratic Party leadership, beholden to labor unions traditionally that oppose trade agreements, are actually along with Trump. I would challenge any of you to find any leading Democrat in the House or Senate that has opposed President Trump's march towards protectionism and tariffs and trade war. They actually find it fairly appealing. Whereas the base of the Democratic Party, the youth, the cosmopolitan, worldly uh, uh, people that are you know, 40, 45 and under actually want trade. They realize where their cell phone comes from and where their import products come from and their phone, and I mean a car is made and so on. And that creates a really difficult problem for us domestically when the party's basis and leadership are at odds. It also means that the current president's policies are not going to face a lot of opposition in Congress. Second, traditionally, this goes across all party lines. We have predominantly put taxes on things that we use the most in the United States. Food, shelter, and, cl and, and uh, clothing. Those are the areas that we have predominantly taxed for a variety of reasons to shield some American companies, to uh, shield farmers from competition in agriculture, for example. Uh, but that also means that for all of the problems, all the worries about trade benefiting only the rich, current US trade policies actually hurt the poor the most, those who spend more of their income on on food, more of their income on clothing, and more on their income on shelter, housing. And with the attempt to tax lumber and steal more, it is only going to worsen this relative impact. That is, those who have less will spend more, those who have more will feel much less of an impact. Okay. Um, and I also, want to get to highlight the thing um, about shipping and airlines because hopefully most of you in this room will at some point have the opportunity to travel abroad, perhaps study abroad during your college time. I don't care where you go, just get out of the country for a while and see some other place. It's worth it, it's valuable. You can ask people in here who have done it. But one of the reasons why it's so expensive to fly from the United States and fly inside the United States is because we don't allow competition on airlines. We have a law going back to 1949, you ban foreign ownership of airlines, and that's why we have three big airlines that eat 80% of the market. Why is this important to you? Because it means that you, when you want to go out and visit your relatives in California, or fly down to Costa Rica, or study abroad, you will pay two to three times more than the same person making that trip from Europe into the US or elsewhere into the United States. Okay, um, finally, the other part of the cost is not just taxes and um, what we call tariffs, but we also subsidize and, and put quotas on things coming into the country. And that simply means the following. We use tax dollars, your money that you pay into Uncle Sam, mine, and we give them to farmers and sugar growers and corn growers and tobacco growers and say, we're going to help offset your costs at the taxpayer's expense. And at the same time, we're going to tell the Canadians and the Europeans, you can't sell us your high quality dairy. You can't sell us your tobacco. You can't sell us certain other things because we want to protect our market. So there are a variety of things that go into protecting uh, um, the issues, the, the, the products that we use, the services we use, um, and increases the price of that product. Okay, so getting to the third part, trade agreements. What are they and why are they bad? Um, little be known to the majority of Americans, 
in 2015 and 2016, millions of people protested across the United States and Europe and parts of Asia against various trade agreements that the United States were then negotiating. One of those trade agreements was called the Trans-Pacific Partnership with a bunch of countries in, in Asia and South America and the United States. Most of these protests were organized by civil society organizations or non-for-profit organizations, consumer groups, welfare groups, uh, environmental organizations, and some labor unions in the United States. And they were very, very effective in their messaging. One of the areas that I've, I've written extensively on is framing. Depending on how I convey a message to you, you will interpret it very differently. And in terms of, tr in the trade world, the civil society or non-for-profit organizations have become astute at framing the message so that you, the recipient, the honest person who doesn't know much about it, I mean, who can expect, how many of you are expected to sit and read through a 3,000 page trade agreement and all the technical details, right? So you take messages from people that you trust. And I like some of these photos, this one included from Miami, as you see, because they're protesting against an agreement that they say will outsource jobs and cost lower wages, et cetera. But the irony and beauty and problem enveloped in this picture is that they all wear clothes from abroad. They are in front of the very symbol of world power emanating from the United States. Aside from the military, there's no brand that is more well known than McDonald's. There's actually a term in political science called the McWorld phenomenon, where globalization becomes this homogenous US blurb that just absorbs everyone else, right? The French had a heyday with this about 20 years ago. Uh, but the, the irony and the beauty is you can't escape it even when you're protesting against an agreement that's supposed to make more of it, right? Um, so briefly, what is trade agreement? Well, first of all, it's not really about the taxes on products that we're about to increase. Because most trade agreements today actually have to do with things like under what circumstances and under what standards can you produce a toaster oven or a car part or a software that goes into a computer? In what way and where can a business move physically staff from one country to another country to another country? Because if you come up with the next best software program, you want to not just stay in the United States because we're a relatively small population compared to the rest of the world. You want to expand. So where you're allowed to expand, how you're allowed to expand, how you're allowed to employ people, where you're allowed to sell your product, and under what circumstances you're allowed to physically move yourself or your staff to another country is really important. Right? Other things that are really important in a trade agreement has to do with things like regulation. Most of you have probably had an Advil or an ibuprofen or Tylenol in your life. Most have probably driven a car or ridden in one. And to think that a car or a drug produced in Japan or Switzerland or US would be less safe than if they're produced in any of the other three is pretty hard for people to believe. But if today you produce a car, or assemble a car in France and export it to the US, you have to go through an entire testing product again, testing process again, and vice versa. If you produce a Headache, a pill for headaches, like Aleve or Advil, in Germany today, you have to have it retested in the US again. Luckily, on the last part, we've started to move closer to next year. You, you don't have to have that testing again. But, and my favorite is Dutch eggs. Um, give an example here. California had an egg crisis two years ago. Yeah, the chickens were somehow got infected. You couldn't produce enough eggs. It's a big state. And so they couldn't find enough eggs in the country. 
And you're banned from importing eggs from the European Union, from any country in Europe. So the Food and Drug Administration actually sent inspectors over to the Netherlands and went through various farms and said, yeah, your chickens and your processes and your eggs are acceptable in the United States. So yeah, we'll give you an exception you can sell to them. <laughs> you don't have to have been in the Netherlands to understand. You, I can pretty much assure you any egg you eat in the Netherlands is as safe as any egg you'll eat in the United States. But the, the process here is Farmers in the United States are protected and given preferences because you're not allowed to export German eggs or Dutch eggs or Finnish eggs to the United States. And neither are you into the EU, by the way, so it's equally high. Um, okay, I'm not going to go e through each of these, um, but mention this trade diversion because that's where we're going to get to steel and aluminum in the current process. So, the US says, you know what, we're going to protect those men and women who work in the steel mills, in the aluminum smelters in the United States, and we're going to ban certain steel products coming in from anywhere else in the world. Then we make exceptions. So the Canadians and Mexicans, they're fine. But others, we're going to ban. Okay, so China's sitting over here. They're making a lot of this stuff. And they're saying, okay, we can't sell it to the United States because they're going to impose a 25% tax and they're going to put in quotas. They're going to tell us, you can't sell more than a certain amount to us. Let the Americans suffer the price because companies are going to shut down, the cars are going to become more expensive. But where do you think the China, what do you think the Chinese are going to do? They're going to sell, well, wait a minute, we'll sell it into Europe or we'll sell it into Brazil. And now they're going to go, wait, wait a minute, we're going to put up the same obstacles, right? But in the meantime, Europe is upset with the U.S. for imposing this and they're retaliating and the Chinese are opposed uh, to this so they're going to retaliate and all of a sudden we're going to have all these these arrows going across the world where people are trying to dump products because they can't sell it in like steel or they're going to impose restrictions. And what's going to happen? You and I and other consumers are going to pay a lot more for our products. I gave specific examples of that in a minute. Uh, this is another favorite photo of mine from a uh, protest in Germany against a trade agreement between the US and Europe that is actually frozen. It's not negotiated anymore. But the Europeans fear that the Americans would be such bullies and usurp higher European standards and run amok with regulations because in the Europeans' eyes, the U.S. is all the Wild West, and we have no regulations and no standards, and we eat crap, and that is not made up. That's actually a quote from a parliamentarian in Europe. <laughs> uh, and so the image in Europe was, well, we can't deal with the Americans because, you know, they're just going to take us over. Um, but I said that people oppose trade agreements. Let's listen to one of these very well-crafted, well-targeted, framed messages about what trade agreements actually do. And notice the affir affirmation in there, the definitive statements, the absolutes, and the very scary undertone. This is admirably well done. To address climate disruption, we need to fully embrace clean energy and stop the use and export of coal, oil, and gas. But right now, there's a trade deal, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, that would threaten our ability to make these changes. The United States and 11 other countries in the Pacific Rim are negotiating this secret trade deal. TPP negotiations are closed to the public, but open to select corporate executives. So it's no surprise that the TPP would give broad new rights to coal, oil, gas, and other multinational companies. They could sue the U.S. government in secret trade courts over laws and policies that reduce their profits. That means half a century of environmental progress threatened just to deepen big corporations' pockets. Similar trade deals like NAFTA have favored corporations over countries. Under these packs, corporations have challenged the laws in over 100 countries, increasingly attacking policies that protect our air, water, and climate. 
the Trans-Pacific Partnership also includes rules that would require the U.S. Department of Energy to automatically approve all exports of natural gas to countries in the pact. This would open the floodgates for fracking across the United States and create more dangerous climate emissions. This is just some of what we know about the TPP. What lurks in the shadows of the pact may be even worse. The time has come to build a new model of trade that puts communities and our environment above corporate profits. So it's very, oops. Oh, okay. That was, um, I expected something else there, but uh, so notice four things. Secret, the negotiations are secret. Uh, this will force the government to do a bunch of stuff. And it will allow corporations to sue governments whenever they want. And um, we will all suffer for it because corporations will win. Now, this is very effective. It's admirably effective. Right? Um, the problem is most of those things are already allowed under US law currently. Um, but, uh, secondly, um, trade negotiations are normally secret because if you have ever negotiated a sensitive agreement, you want to be able to, to give and take, to have trade-offs, to be able to uh, strike compromises for the greater good. Not to put anyone in, in specific at disadvantage, but for the greater good of the agreement. Um, and, se and thirdly, I've asked every single representative of a opposition groups, of which I've spent a lot of time in the last four years, uh, what a corporation is and when, it turn, when a nice mom and pop sto store and a family owned company turns into this big evil corporation that nonetheless employs people and gives them benefits and hires people and trains people. Nobody's been able to answer that. But this, the purpose of showing this, even though the Trans-Pacific Partnership was one of the agreements that President Trump withdrew the United States from, is twofold. A, it shows the effectiveness of framing. And it is very effective. This actually was part of the campaign that led to the opposition in Congress because constituencies rose up and said, we don't want this. But B, to also show that the US is no longer indispensable. In fact, this agreement has moved on with the other 11 countries. They have signed it, they're ratifying it, and they are implementing it. And what does that mean for you and I? If you work in a company in the United States that exports to Japan, that exports to Mexico, that exports to Chile, uh, or Australia, or New Zealand, you will now find that your products are a great disadvantage. Because the other countries that are part, their businesses, their firms, will now have access freely to those markets. So if you produce beef, or pork, or bourbon, or software, you will now be at a disadvantage, a significant disadvantage. So it has real life implications for real people's lives. Another of these op opposition arguments, and I, I apologize for the blurriness of the photo, or the, the character, excuse me, the drawing. Uh, but this is basically to show that trade and trade agreements are supposed to lead to a race to the bottom. This is one company chasing another company, and this is supposed to signify slavery. Right? Yes? Yeah, yeah, I know. I apologize. I, I included it simply because it's very symbolic. The, don't worry about the name of the companies. Each, each fat man running down the hill is supposed to represent a, con a company, a firm. right? And the firms are constantly chasing ever lower standards, ever lower wages, until we get to the point where slavery is back in, in business again. And companies rule and... Um, people don't have much say. And that's supposed to symbolize this notion that when you have open trade, corporations will just move to wherever it's most beneficial for them and people will suffer. Right? Um, so that is the argument against these preferential trade agreements or trade agreements. But as we've seen with some of the arguments before, that doesn't really always hold water. Opponents also have, have self-interest, of course. They raise money. This is politics. You have different ideas, 
You compete for ideas. Right? They raise money, they get funds, they get more supporters, then they can work on other stuff as well. Um, another problem with this is some of the countries in the world that have the most open access to trade, that have more trade agreements than anyone else, South Korea, the European Union, uh, are actually the most prosperous. So the correlation between protecting and imposing barriers actually don't work very well. Um, third, to lead into what we're all getting to, steel and aluminum and the current potential for trade war, President Trump is nowhere near the most uh, daring or uninformed or challenging or brave, depending upon your views, president we've had. Um, Thomas Jefferson closed the country, literally closed the country for 13 months. He closed every port, banned exports, banned imports, 1807 to early 1809. It didn't work very well. The economy dropped about 10%. That would be about $2 trillion if we did that today. Not a very enticing proposition. Right? Um, Others have, on different occasions, expressed various hesitancies in engaging on trade. <coughs> so trade has always been a feature of American politics and a debate domestically. But it has, for the most part, been an elitist, you know, government-defined and bureaucratic sort of issue. Right? On occasion, presidents have spoken up. But of course, in the 19th century, the country was small. We did have a very sort of rudimentary economy. And most importantly, if you study history, and I know at least one of our vice presidents is an adamant <laughs> historian of US uh, policy, uh, throughout the entire 19th century in the United States, we had basically free immigration, open borders. We had technology flowing in, particularly from England. Uh, we had artists and artisans and uh, skilled personnel coming in. It was a very different system than we have today. So it compensated for the type of, of uh, terrorist and protectionist measures that many presidents advocated back then. Um, the, so the issue here is it's not the first time it's happened, but it may be the most dangerous one. In 1930, uh, we had something in the United States called this, the uh, Smoot-Hawley Act. If you haven't heard of it, don't worry. If, what, if the current trend continues, you will all know this by the end of the year. Um, we decided during the Depression that we were going to impose very high tariffs, import duties, on a whole host of products. That led to a trade war where other countries uh, increased their tariffs on U.S. products. And then they decided, you know what? We're going to stick it to the U.S. So the British Empire and the, all the states that were part of the British Empire, former and current at that time, decided we're going to abolish all the restrictions amongst ourselves but keep it against the United States. It took a couple of years and we realized this was a pretty darn bad idea. And then we went off it. In 2002, Bush tried to do something similar just on steel and a few other products. It took nine months, and we went off it. So what is happening right now? First, we are renegotiating the North Atlantic Free Trade Agreement. Trump has initiated this renegotiation. The Canadians and French are participating. They are fairly open to renegotiating this. But Trump has also threatened to pull out of this, to pull out of NAFTA that's been in place since 1994. So what does it mean for those of us in the room here? Well, if you have families in farming, it doesn't look very good. Because we export a lot of agricultural products from the United States to Mexico, to Canada, and also elsewhere, of course. Um, and we also export a lot of machinery and a lot of technology and a lot of services, construction services, software, engineering products. And they will all find themselves at a huge disadvantage. Um, fishermen. 
Most of you have probably not thought of lobster fishermen as being a casualty in this process. But if you go up to Maine, they are worried, really worried. Because right now, without the U.S. having an agreement with the European Union, which we froze, we're not negotiating anymore, the Canadians are hogging all the lobster exports. And there are 2,000 families in the Northeast that are depending upon the lobster industry. And when the Canadians, north of the border, can export their products 10% cheaper to the Europeans, I promise you, a German and Frenchman do not care where their lobster came from, whether it's Canada or the U.S. Um, if you're in the middle of Kansas today, you're sitting on a whole lot of wheat that normally goes to Mexico. But because the threat of pulling out of this agreement is real, the Mexican buyers have now turned to Brazil, Peru, and Argentina instead. As of today, China announced that if President Trump imposes the threatened tariffs on um, steel and aluminum on Chinese incoming products to the United States and other products from China, he's at an additional $50 billion worth, soybean farmers in the United States, whose largest market is China, will see a 25% tariff increase. If that materializes, more people will lose their job in the soybean industry than all people who could possibly gain work in the steel industry because of this in tariff. Ginseng. Most of you probably, some of you probably don't even know what it is. It's a type of vegetable herb that you put in food, that you use for medicinal purposes. Um, we have actually a large export market from the U.S. to China. That will all disappear. You slap 25% tariff on that, it will, go, it will be gone. Uh, a third example, coal miners are another area, another sort of hardcore uh, manufacturing area um, sector that Trump has promised to support. Noble idea. But for the fact that, for example, Brazil sells us certain types of steel that we cannot produce in the United States. The steel mills in, in Brazil are fueled by coal. Where do you think that coal comes from? West, West Virginia. So if you impose a 25% steel tariff, as we have done, on Brazil and keep it, they will buy their coal elsewhere. And you will lose additional jobs in West Virginia for something that seemingly is completely unrelated. That goes back to the example that the world is highly interdependent. You may think that you support a particular area by imposing taxes, restrictions, quotas on certain products. Well, you'd be hurting other industries. How many of you eat ready whipped cream? Or at least acknowledge that you do. Okay, one brave soil. Soul, sorry. <laughs> okay. The steel that goes into those are imported. And it is of a particular type that cannot be made in the United States. We simply do not have the facilities. And that is loaded onto a truck, brought up to, I believe it is Wisconsin, where the main factory is, and then filled with American dairy, which in itself is good. But if you impose that tariff and you keep the existing restrictions on European and Canadian dairy, you are, in fact, telling all of us here that it is worth paying 30% 30, 30 more for that can of whipped cream than it would otherwise cost. Finally, we build a lot, and we're building a new student center, activity center here on campus. You need a lot of steel for that. You need a lot of steel to go into the construction equipment, the machinery, Caterpillar, John Deere, ring a bell. We also cannot make the steel that are used in most of the construction equipment and the sturdiest rails that we use to, to use for freight 
uh, shipments in the United States. We simply don't have the facilities. They come from Japan. Japan has not been exempt from these tariffs. What, what does that mean? These companies and Norfolk Southern, a big freight uh, uh, company, uh, train company, are now heavily lobbying the Bush administration for exemptions because they cannot withstand a 25% increase in cost. They will lay off workers. They will stop investments. They will stop construction. And if you're a business, look, if we're going to build here on campus, then contractors are going to say, well, my investment in my equipment now went up 20 22% and you're, I'm going to pass it on to you, that's going to affect the costs here, just as one you know, minor example. So because of the interdependence in the world and because you, have produce, you produce things in, in one part of the world because it's efficient, because you have resources, because shipping is, is, is cheap, now when we start imposing these arbitrary restrictions, it's sort of like Imagine you have a factory, and somewhere on the factory floor in the conveyor belt, you just drop a, a, a concrete slab and say, you got to get over this somehow. That's pretty much the equivalent of saying either you're not allowed to sell your product or we're going to impose these massive costs on you. If you have nowhere else to turn, if you have no alternatives, your company is going to be hurt, and your workers are going to be hurt. Which brings us back to Juncker's response that we had earlier. That's the response from the largest market in, in, in the world. We don't want to do this. We think it's stupid. We think it's stupid because it's going to hurt consumers. It's going to hurt companies that hire people, that provide a living wage. And there are other ways we can deal with this. We recognize that some people cheat, just like you do in sports, like you do in business, with tax. Some companies, some firms cheat. But having these arbitrary responses from one player is not going to change the rules of the game as it's currently played. You have to work with other allies. You have to work collectively to address the problem with China, to address the problem of over the capac overcapacity. So in short, having what seems to be a good response, we're going to protect the steel industry, we're going to protect the aluminum industry, is really not a good idea. And finally, Other players can retaliate. Trump has said that this is for national security purposes. We're imposing these tariffs for national security purposes. The rest of the world doesn't buy it. The rest of the world calls this protectionism. And they have the right to respond. And they will. There are big players in the world in, in terms of production of services and products. They will retaliate. That's how you and I will be hurt. How you and I will feel the repercussions of this. So to summarize, there are ways in which trade and investments increase efficiency and, and, and improve our lives. And there are ways of addressing those who cheat. But the way we're trying to do it is really not one. Um, trade agreements are perceived as discriminatory. Yes. You saw the frame, and that's one of tens of thousands of examples. I've done Google searches. Actually, as students, you can use something called Google Scholar and actually create graphs of certain terms, of certain areas, um, of how much people search for them, when they search for them, uh, in what countries they search for them. And you can get a sense for what is worrying people, what people are fascinated about. And if you type in things like um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership bad or transatlantic trade bad, you'd be surprised what, with the amount of propaganda and sophisticated opposition that you find that has been very, very persuasive. But that also means that our elected officials have to respond. As those who have taken mine and Dr. Mishram and other courses, politics is about perception, not reality. And what people perceive is what uh, policymakers have to respond to. And if you perceive the trade agreements are bad and protecting an industry is good, you're going to win that argument politically. It's not until it hits your pocketbook until that's when you realize that it may not be the best of ideas. Right? And the rest of the world can really retaliate because they're big. They're really, really big. I'm not going to go through all of those points. I can do that in the Q&A. Because I'm going to stop because I think we have uh, half an hour for questions. 
of anything I've said that you disagree with or are curious or confusing uh, or other. <laughs> yes, sir. You said that Trump's reason for doing this is for national security. Yes. What does that mean? In his mind, what does that mean? So, without getting into the weeds, there are a couple of laws in the U.S. that um, from the 1970s that have to do with when you can say that you have the right to impose restrictions on goods that are coming in or services that are coming in. One is because business go and complain and say that someone's cheating or something's doing, unf doing something unfair. Um, the other is when the government self-initiates. It's called the th uh, uh, 232 and says the products that are coming into the United States are threatening our security um, and if unless we take action, our national security, however defined, is threatened. And that's where the vagueness comes in, right? Um, and he has said that because we import a lot of steel and aluminum products that go into everything from building to the military, um, being that reliant upon others is a threat because what if war breaks out or other calamitous events happen? And that's the justification. And under international trade rules in the World Trade Organization, this, this international body that adjudicates between trade disputes, there is a clause. There's an article that says, if a country invokes national security as the justification, we basically can't question it. The problem comes with two things. No one has ever done this as a member. Actually, three things. Second, it's supposed to be only for nuclear issues or related, sensitive, high-quality material. Third, when you do this, and you say that it's for national security, what do you think everyone else does? What do you think Australia, Japan, Saudi Arabia, EU is going to do? They're going to say, well, if it is for national security, we're going to do it too, and our retaliation will be for national security. And, and thus, the entire rule book falls apart. Or they're going to say, we don't believe you. You're actually not doing this for national security reasons. You're doing it to protect your own industries. And because you are, we have the right to retaliate ASAP, right away, with taxes and restrictions on the things that your companies make and export to us. So bourbon and motorcycles and, and software products, you're going to feel that. And the latter is actually what Europeans and Japanese and others have looked at and said. They're not going the national security route. They're not accepting the argument. They're saying you're, you're basically doing this as what's technically called a safeguard or a protectionist measure. Right? And we're going to retaliate right away if you do this. So it's a difficult issue to make in national security because it has all these implications. Others can respond. Others can invoke the same thing. And when you later want the rule book of trade, when you want to penalize another uh, country, uh, you have no longer re any recourse. Can I ask a question about this? Uh, is it possible that uh, President Trump uh, approaching this issue from a more a nationalist ideological point of view and not necessarily considering the economic ramifications like what you're suggesting? Because, uh, I mean, when he was elected, there was, he was a very significant base that they were motivated by the nationalistic kind of ideology. Yes. So oh, yeah. yeah. This is responding to base. And let me be clear. This is, we're talking about U.S. because we're here. This is our country. Uh, and our lives be affected. Um, many of the type of restrictions and quotas and taxes we're talking about at a lower level exist in Europe, in Japan, and a whole host of other countries. It's basically just New Zealand, if you want to take an example, that basically said, screw it all. Business, rise and fall, and survive on your own. Uh, but yes, this is very political. Steel and coal were two industries during the campaign. They said, we are going to revive these. We're going to save them. They are the heart of our manufacturing. Of. We're going to protect them. And now he's following through. Right? The prop that, so the political justification is there. And he's fulfilling what he said during the campaign.
But much research also shows that the farmers, for example, in the Midwest, and the automobile workers in the Midwest and the upper uh, plains that voted for Trump, surprisingly, did not believe they were actually going to go down that route. But now he is. He's fulfilling his pledge. Uh, and the repercussions will be felt throughout the entire economy. Farmers, automobile producers, suppliers, et cetera. Um, because you can't isolate one product anymore. And because other countries, unlike with the rhetoric coming out, other countries can't retaliate. China's a big boy. EU's a big boy. They can slap retaliatory. Japan has weapons to use. And we're not talking military weapons here. We're talking economic ones. They can do so. And no one in, on you know, the upper echelons of our society is going to suffer. But the lower down you are, the lower the income, the more you will feel this if this uh, is actually implemented. Right now, the tariffs on China, the taxes on Chinese imports have not been imposed. The restrictions, the quotas, have not been imposed, but they've been identified. As soon as they are imposed, China's going to impose theirs. Europe is going to impose theirs. And we will all feel the repercussions very quickly. You will he start hearing about layoffs. And this is not a fun thing to say, but these are companies that have already said, if this happens, we cannot continue uh, with the practices we currently do. So it's a, it's a trade off. Yeah. Yes? <laughs> uh, I would like to ask you, you, you I came late, so you may discuss this issue already in your lecture, but I would like to hear your view of the, the linkage between the okay, international global trade, slot, okay, so global free trade issue vis-a-vis -vis domestic social security issue, meaning that, okay, other, the, the, okay, in the short term, at least, whenever you promote trade liberalization, adjustment cost, okay, will be incurred, and somebody, okay, have to carry yes. cost. And also, I mean, the, I believe that, okay, last two details, so this adjustment cost are really more concentrated on the particular segment of society rather than spread. So therefore, the today, the general pattern is such country, European country like your country, Sweden, or the German, okay, which is directly well, okay, known for the directly better okay, provision of the welfare, okay, welfare, okay, welfare, social welfare system, okay, network. These countries are becoming more free, okay, pro-free trade as compared with the traditional American domestically oriented so how do you think Yeah, I mentioned some of that before you came in about the Germany and Sweden. But no, there are costs, of course. There will be sectors that are affected and jobs lost the more you open up. Because, say, there are certain products that are less expensive, more durable, that are made in other countries imported to the U.S. Just like we make certain products that are very attracted, uh, attractive elsewhere in the world. Services, software we don't hear about. Education is an export product. Tourism, we live in the hub of the Poconos, is an export product. Right? Uh, we do services really well. Construction services, we do it really well. But um, certain products we don't make anymore. Now, when it, there are adjustment costs. Coal and steel has, has seen jobs decline because technology has taken over. It's safer to have a robot pour 1,000 degree molds into a container than having people do it. It's safer to have cranes lift four ton you know, uh, 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 um, containers than people do it. Okay? But they have then to find work somewhere else. And the difference is that in countries like you mentioned, like Germany and Denmark and Sweden, while, as I mentioned earlier, the labor laws, particularly in Scandinavia, are very, very flexible, then there is no permanent employment and guaranteed employment. There's also a much greater realization about job retraining, both from employers and the government. Um, I spoke to a few others the other day. When Germany was hit during the recession, 08 or 09, they took a nosedive far greater in the US, but they recuperated much quicker. And what they did was government stepped in, worked with companies, and they paid half of workers' salaries during that time period. And the corporations paid the other half. And they went down to about 80% of their previous salaries. But then government paid half, corporations paid half. They retrained, regrouped, and actually came out more effective and more efficient and increased 
their sales of engineering products after the recession, outcompeting the Chinese domestically in China, right? Because of quality. Uh, so it's a built-in safety net. In Sweden, there's retraining. In Netherlands, the employers are required to help the people they lay off find work again. In Denmark, you can hire fired ease, but if you, as a laid-off worker, do not accept one of the first three jobs offered, you get no social assistance whatsoever. But if you do, you will never be hungry and you will never lose your house. So there are, there are, there are trade-offs. So there are a variety of different models. Right? We don't have that model in the United States. There is less assistance. There is very little vocational training investment outside of what Siemens and some Japanese companies have done on site in the South. Right? But there is very little in terms of job training safety nets in the United States. Um, and that is a problem for a variety of reasons. There's, it, it, there, you know, we're a big country territorially and uh, population-wise, different ideological views. Uh, but that's how some of the other countries have handled it. And that's why the Germans and the Swedes can be so pro-trade. Right? And the unions advocate more openness and more dismantlement of barriers. Uh, because they know that's how they can compete. That's how they can create jobs. Right? Um, so it, there are different ways of addressing that. But yes, there will be job displacements. Obviously, when there was when we went from agriculture to computers to, to, to service industry. And think of you in this room. I guarantee you, half of you who are under 25 will work in jobs in the future that we have not yet come up with. And there are jobs today that didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, so we, we have ways of coming up with new jobs, but we also then need people who know how to do them. And that goes back to why American companies invest in Europe rather than Angola or, or Botswana or, or Bangladesh more often, because they have training and they have advanced you know, skills that they can use. That's not to say that Americans don't have them. But there is a dearth of skills in a lot of areas. Look at the US Labor Department's site today. Slightly less than 5 million job openings in the United States today, as we speak. Half of them are positions that currently cannot be filled by, th by those who are looking for work. So that goes again back to the education part. Uh, so there, those things are all interdependent. And there's no one solution to this. There's no cut two countries have done approached it the same way. All right, uh, I have another question. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned that Germany and some of the European countries, uh, labor unions uh, are also interested in more trade. In the north, yes. Yeah. Is it possible because uh, in those countries they have better social safety nets than we do, so consequently workers are not worried if they get unemployed? versus like, you know, in our country, that can be a factor, like a social system or social system. There's two responses. Yes, but also because the company, the, the sectors with the highest unionization are export sectors. Mm -hmm. um, and, th and secondly, unions work differently in the North. In, in, uh, for example, in Scandinavia, unions are, do supplemental pensions, supplemental health insurance, supplemental unemployment insurance. So that's why you can say ban closed union shops, but still have 60, 70 percent unionization because they provide incentives. Right? In Germany, union, uh, unions negotiate both locally and nationally and provide incentives for members. Um, same in Denmark. But in the South, in Europe, in Spain, in Portugal, and Greece, when you speak to union members there, they say, we don't trust government. We would agree to support more liberalization through the European Union. Um, that because no country in Europe actually negotiates trade, you're banned from doing so. It's all within this 28 member country, uh, member European Union. But we would support that. We would we would rally for more agreement if we believed that the government, in turn, would provide more assistance for training and unemployment. So the labor unions say from from France down, do not trust them. So it's very you know it's very similar dilemma to like here, but in the north. There's an element of trust and cooperation that that lends themselves to being more open to trade and supportive. Yeah. Yes, sir. So you were speaking on how other countries 
cheap when it comes to like you know trading and mm -hmm. economically, especially on the national level. How could that issue be addressed, and what restrictions or policies could be placed so that everything would be fair? So most economists that look at this um, would say China produces more surplus steel, more extra steel per year than all steel produced in North America, <coughs> which is huge. If countries in North America, Canada, Mexico, and the US, the Europeans, Australians, and Japanese all together approach the Chinese, either with threats of imposing simultaneous tariffs or quotas, or saying, look, we know that you have surplus capacity. You need to cut down on the number of steel mills and aluminum smelters because the Chinese government built them as part of their development policy to create jobs, to create more cities, to, to develop the country, right? But the side effect of that is you have all of this production that now it needs to go somewhere, right? So if you collectively did that, they would have nowhere to sell. And so you could actually address that problem, right? Uh, and China could close, start closing some of those that they don't even need domestically. But as long as there's a market out there, they're going to sell it. Companies in China are going to sell it. So if the US tries this alone, it's not going to do very much because they're going to try to sell it elsewhere. And then you can have other countries and other firms that are upset with this competition. So you need to work collectively with your allies and friends and other markets to do so. Right? so that, and if that didn't work, if everyone said, we're going to impose restrictions, you can only sell 80% of what you sold last year to us, they would have a similar effect. But it's this doing it unilaterally by yourself, it won't have any effect because there are so many other places where they can go. And then you upset those markets. And then they get upset in Europe with the US or Japan with the US because now China's companies are trying to sell it to them instead. So you doing it unilaterally is the big mistake and is the reason why this won't work. The Chinese government has a lot of excess what's called foreign reserves. They have a lot of excess money. They have a lot of subsidy programs in place. They can withstand a trade war with the US, regardless of what President Trump says. If I may add also, Chinese are heavily involved in uh, the Middle East and in African countries. They're investing, for example, you know, their major trade agreement with the country of Iran. <coughs> It's just yep. unbelievable. If yep. you, if you there are other it. markets. Yep. There are other markets where this will go. And that will then come back and bite the US and Europeans too because the, the steel goes into other markets. They can produce steel products cheaper, which then as a product ends up in the US or in Europe or Japan. You will find that you, you know, you'll see the effects of that the same way. And it's, it's, it's really difficult to address any type of, of cheating or trade imbalance unilaterally today, one country at a time. It's, it's, it's really, really difficult to do so. Uh, yes, countries cheat. Uh, even companies, corporations, firms at times skirt regulations, uh, skirt uh, um, rules of the game. But there are trade rules in place in the United States, in the World Trade Organization, in treaties between different countries and different regions to address that specific issue. Uh, there's something called 301 uh, in the United States Code um, that I wrote papers on in 06 and 07. I never, no one thought they would ever come back, but now President Trump has brought them back again. Um, and it's basically saying if you cheat on selling your products too cheaply in the United States or you dump too much of them, um, you're undermining the fairness you know, we can't, we can't play game, we can't play fair with you. Um, and so we have the right to retaliate. So there are ways in to address this. Um, but in a globalized world where products flow across borders much quicker than before, it is really difficult to do this unilaterally. And you are going to upset a lot of countries. Look, the Canadians are nice, okay? That's basically their, <laughs> their national motto. We're nice, okay? Uh, but they're really upset. Because they've been targeted by Trump as playing unfair and you cheat us uh, of this and that or the other. Um, 
it, it really it is politically difficult when you upset friends and allies and foes alike, but it's also economically damaging. They provide a lot of lumber that goes into building houses. So the steel <laughs> and lumber will become a big issue if the Canadians, as the, cur the current administration has threatened, is also going to pose tariffs on lumber, increased tariffs on lumber from Canada. So those housing costs, <laughs> the construction costs, are going to go up further if that's the case. Right? Um, so this is the, it really hits the pocketbook. And it's easy to say, well, it's just a penny per can of soup. Or it's just 350 bucks per car. Or, but you know, you add up all the products one by one. For a family of four making 60,000 in rural Kansas, who simultaneously loses a job because the soybean market and the wheat market has dried up and the bourbon can't be exported, that's going to have a huge impact. Wow, I've probably <laughs> depressed all of you by now. <laughs> okay. Actually, just one last question. Okay. I am depressed. But <laughs> 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 so you talked about the perceptions of this politics, yes. our politics, I guess, or is politics. But so what's, how does that other side of it? Because um, there is this other constituency besides the base that is, a, is for trade and for the economic and connectedness. I'll, I'll tell you what the biggest business association across the Atlantic, American companies and European companies representing 60% of global trade and investment said when I spoke to one of the representatives two years ago. Uh, they gave up marketing the TPP and TTIP because on Twitter they were out-tweeted I guess that's a new verb. Uh, 99 to 1. On YouTube, they are outpaced 95 to 9. On social media in general, positive messaging about trade made up 3%. And these are, these are actually academic studies from Georgetown and from uh, 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 Germany and elsewhere. Uh, so we were outcompeted, uh, outdone, outpaced rhetorically. Um, by a very effective opposition campaign. Um, and so many of the groups that were part of the NAFTA opposition in the 90s and anti-globalization at that time were revitalized. Some of the groups in the United States, like Public Citizen, and in Europe, like, like um, Compact, quadrupled their budget, their, their revenue streams, their, their uh, employees, uh, and had newfound uh, resurgence in purpose with the TPP and TTIP. <laughs> so, yes, they, I mean, they, they simply, there wasn't a voice that were heard effectively enough. And part of that also, we should remember, is that corporations were not in the best light after the financial crisis, right? And in, case, in the case of Europe, which, has, like, is, which is now the world leader in trade, no doubt. They're signing, left, they're signing agreements with Mexico, with Canada, uh, with Latin America. Europe is leading the pace on trade, no doubt about it. Uh, the issue there was that none of the governments were, were, had the courage to stand up and speak for an agreement with the US because the perception in Europe of us being these Wild West capitalist cowboys with no regulations and eating crap was so pervasive. And that's, that's why perception matters a lot more than facts. Because no one driving a Mercedes in the US is worried about safety, and nobody eating chocolate in Switzerland is worried about safety, right? So that, that's where perception, or sushi in Japan. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.